the second bull run. Jackson is set up here west of the abandoned rail line. Here we have the cavalry in column ready to move out and protect the army from the flanks. First run is Reno's 9th Corps. They're going to march on a road from Manassas Junction right up towards Buck Hill where the rest of the Union Army is. Now let me run through a little few basic points on this map with the roads. The only major road on this map is the Warrington Turnpike. All the other roads are minor roads. The Warrington Turnpike has two solid lines denoting it. The other roads, the minor roads, have a solid line and a dotted line. The various streams and brooks have one solid line. These dark lines are the railroads and they have no in-game function. And then Stuart goes riding off down the road. Army Virginia 3rd Corps. Now their commander is McDowell and he comes in on the second day. So on the first day General Pope is commanding Army of Virginia 3rd Corps. moves his artillery up towards Groveton, and his infantry marches towards Stony Ridge. AOP 3rd Corps, under Heinzelman, comes down the Warrington Turnpike. Again, I have these wooden block markers that I use to mark when units are moving in column, and when they're moving on minor roads, they show the distance between units that are stretched out on minor roads. I've put a link in the description where you can go to order your own. They're not necessary, but they're kind of cool to have. And the Army Potomac 5th Corps under Fitz John Porter comes up from the southern side. He's worried about the cavalry he sees and doesn't know how many southern forces are over here, maybe the whole southern army. So one of his divisions deploys on the road and his whole command basically breaks up right there. Now last is Army of Virginia 1st Corps under Siegel. Since he doesn't have to worry about being outflanked, he attacks without regard to his flanks. And now we move on to turn one combat. Now second bull run, the Union would like to amass its forces first and then attack, but on turn three Longstreet comes in with his huge, powerful corps. They're trying to knock out Jackson's corps early. Jackson has skirmishers out front. and only rolls one die. Skirmishers are destroyed. A.P. Hill's men move up. They send one block packing. Second block moves up. Although they drive Hill's men back, there's nothing left of them. The effort has destroyed them entirely. And on the side, facing skirmishers. Skirmishers fall back. The main troops move up. Steinler falls back. A poor showing indeed for the northern attack. Turn two, mid-morning. Again, Reno's corps moves first. They veer south, not wanting to run afoul of Heinzelman's corps. Speaking of, Heinzelman's corps arrives. Hooker's division moves up and comes out of column. He sends his artillery north of Bull Run. Upon seeing this, Jackson wishes he'd left some cavalry here to deal with this. Next is Porter's Corps. Porter fans out to contain the southern forces. Stewart is activated. He occupies Mount Pone to survey the area. Army of Virginia 1st Corps is activated. And Pope advances forward and guards his flank. Now Army of Virginia 1st Corps has been drawn. They are within command range of their commander Sigel and they rally. I'm trying an experimental rule where baggage trains aren't used and HQs are used to rally. Review at the end. Jackson is drawn. AP Hill's men are within command range of Jackson. They rally. But they cannot move up and join the line. Which would I rather do? You know what? They're going to move up, join the line, remain spent. Because they don't think the North is going to attack again right away. 
That is the end of turn two. Turn three, Longstreet will be arriving this turn. Army Virginia 3rd Corps is drawn and Pope sends the forces in. Guards awards the turnpike and stays out of range of the southern artillery. Eno's 9th Corps forms up east of Buck Hill. And Longstreet arrives. Lee heads north to support Jackson. As Longstreet brings his corps on. Porter cautiously forms up his corps. The problem here, of course, is that Porter's entire corps is being held up by a few cavalry, but they can't let them get behind or there will be, oh, all heck to pay. Stuart continues his annoying presence, guarding the flank while Longstreet approaches. And Siegel's men attack. Now Jackson's activated. He moves his artillery to rake along the abandoned rail line and not being able to wait he flanks the Union attack. But Heinzelman attacks him and deploys the rest of his force. Meanwhile, his artillery moves up to Sudley Mansion. As the detachment races up to protect it. Here we are, late morning combat. Was this flank attack executed in error? Because it looks like A.P. Hill's men are in trouble. But first we do the main combat. Steinwehr's men are driven back. But now we have A.P. Hill attacked in the rear with nowhere to run. A.P. Hill is eliminated. Now the second round of that combat. Back with the units over the abandoned railroad. No one is left unbloodied, but Ewell's men are driven back. And now Pope's drive. Confederate skirmishers are in front. Skirmishers hold and do some damage. They fall back. The main line moves forward. But man, the dog Reynolds is having his day. Another southern block destroyed. Jackson is reduced to one block. And now it's more it's noon. Reno's Corps races forward with fresh troops. Jackson rallies Ewell's men. The southern line is almost broken. Porter continues his slow move to the side. Stewart races to stabilize the situation on the other flank. With Stewart gone, the remaining Southern Cavalry merely holds. Pope takes the Army of Virginia 3rd Corps and drives in on Jackson's artillery. He moves the artillery forward right into Groveton. Army of Potomac 3rd Corps. Under Heinzelman, they begin moving to outflank Jackson's position on Sudley Mountain. Longstreet, realizing all these Union units have moved already, counterattacks Pope's drive and deploys the rest of his line. Sigel rallies his corps. Combat in the center. In a worst possible scenario, the Union troops are outflanked and facing artillery, which fires first. But the dice do not favor them. Reynolds retreats, King moves forward. They do two hits, and the artillery, which is unsupported, is eliminated when it's forced to retreat. King's men decide to hold their 
too far ahead in the enemy lines, they can't get out of there. They have to fight. And Hood's Texans see the end of that formation. Midday check-in. And you have the Confederate forces with two infantry blocks lost. Union forces with two infantry blocks lost. The Confederate army breaks with four blocks lost. The Union army breaks with six blocks lost. Since the Union's attacking, it's not done yet. We're moving into the afternoon. Army Virginia, 3rd Corps is drawn. Pope has to pull Reynolds troops out of the field of fire. Porter continues to sidle along. Technically, when they do this, they turn, move, turn. So that's what they're doing, but I just slide them over because that's the end result. Smooth, clean play. Siegel's first corps flies at the enemy. Jackson's corps falls back behind Sudley Mountain. Longstreet's corps. First off, they flank attack, begin spreading their line out and reinforcing their leftmost flank. And Stuart's cavalry. They fall back to protect the line, and Stuart deploys his cavalry along the left flank. What they're going to try to do is stabilize this. Ninth Corps can't, they can't do that, but Jesse Reno can do that, and he will. Army of Potomac, 3rd Corps. Let me measure this. They can say outside of the line of sight. And here they say beyond the line of fire. And when I activated Pope, I forgot to move the artillery and the detachments for like the last four hours. They've been without orders. What? Pope made a mistake? No. Combat in the mid-afternoon. Hood's Texans attacking from the flank. The silver dice are the Union dice. I've rolled two fours, which are normally hits, but they're flanked, so fours don't hit. They've done nothing. Now the Southern, the brass dice, the Southern, are yellow, three hits, and even without adding one, they get three hits. That destroys a block, and this block will retreat. Reno's attack on Anderson's division. Anderson's on a hill. He has cover. All right. That is a four. It does not hit because they're minus one firing up the hill. Each side does two hits. Anderson falls back. They easily avoid the other troops. However, the Union troops fall back and they push back a whole lot of troops. The Union Center is in confusion. And now it's late afternoon. Reno moves into Groveton, reforms his lines. Now they can't see here, the field of fire does not extend at that range. Longstreet, this is sooner than Longstreet would like to move. He rallies his troops and forms up his line. Army of Virginia First Corps has lost two of three, so it's now exhausted and can no longer rally. They will turn, they will hold. Army of Potomac Third Corps. They will outflank Ewell, but Ewell hasn't moved yet, so when Jackson's drawn, he'll simply fall back. So what they're really doing is they're outmaneuvering him and forcing him to fall back. Army of Potomac Fifth Corps. They continue to sidle, but guard this flank. They desperately love to throw them into it, but with the cavalry out there, they can't just do that. Army Virginia 3rd Corps. This is when Pope activates. He's going to recover everybody. They're all rallied. And I'm going to remember to move these units. There's a ford right here, so they can cross the bull run. This detachment will follow the road and come out of column behind the artillery. Cavalry. Well now we've got this kind of under control and it would be nice to have cavalry, active cavalry out on this flank. So 
the Seward's Cavalry forms up on the road again, they get to there. It looked like the South was lost, but they seem to have regained their position. And now Jackson's Corps is able to move. They have to move beyond the field of fire, which they have. And now it's early evening. Army of Virginia 3rd Corps and Pope activates to move 3rd Corps. The artillery moves up to Sudley Mountain. The other artillery is right beside it. And he strengthens the line. And Stuart is drawn. He maneuvers his cavalry around the Union flank. Come out of column, trying to stretch the Union line out. Reno's 9th Corps attacks, trying to cause a crisis on the Confederate left. Porter continues to extend to refuse the flank on the left. Heintzelman's 3rd Corps attacks. Longtree is activated. At Stuart's request, he positions his artillery on Mount Pone. And he continues to make the Union pay for the irrational exuberance. When he hears the explosions behind Sudley Mountain, he sends over his troops to support Heintzelman's men. Who's been irrationally exuberant now? Jackson knows a losing situation when he sees it and he pulls back. Dinner time combat. The two fours are three, adding one to all those because Hood's men are flanking these. That destroys a block. The North rolled 4, 5, and 6. The 4 doesn't hit, so they did 2 on Hood. This block is destroyed. Hood's elite. He ignores the first hit. Second hit flips him to spent, and he retreats away. But he does push units ahead of him. Combat in the center. South has cover. The two fours miss. South does 2 damage. 2 hits. Reno's men are thrown back. Here Reno's attacking, but he's outflanked. That does not hit. Those two hit. Two hits and two hits. Two hits destroys Reno, and that ends the combat. At this point, South has still only lost two blocks, whereas the North has lost five. One more loss and they're broke. South can take two more losses. At this point, a cautious player, actually on both sides, will probably hold off on pushing the armies any more this day, wait for night to come, recover the losses at night, and begin again tomorrow. That's one option, but I have a flair for the dramatic. So in the early evening, they're still going to go. They're still going to push. Stuart's cavalry continues to advance to the flank. We might not be cautious, but we're not going to be foolish. This is Reno's 9th Corps. They're exhausted. They can't rally. They're going to fall back behind a line of skirmishers. Army of Virginia 1st Corps. Now, Pope can activate with the Army of Virginia 1st Corps, but when Army of Virginia 3rd Corps is drawn, he can't command or rally them. He already will have moved. But he's going to activate with Siegel's 1st Corps because he can fire the artillery. The artillery turns and fires on the Confederate block. He gets one hit. Siegel moves forward to flank attack. Since Pope's activated, he's advancing artillery behind Sudley Mountain. Theoretically, cutting off the Southern escape. He'll be able to fire at them when they, if they try to escape. And now Jackson is drawn. He sends a detachment off to flank Steinware and positions his troops accordingly. Army Potomac 3rd Corps, under Heinzelman, only has this block left. They're just going to move out here. They could attack Hood, but Hood hasn't activated yet and he'll just move away and leave them blocking the artillery. So they're going to move just like they moved. Army of Virginia 3rd Corps. Now I'd love to move them to attack, but they can't do that. Actually, they can. The rule is quite simple. All they have to be able to is trace line of command, either to their leader or the army leader. The army leader is here. It doesn't matter if the army leader has already moved and stuff. Can they draw on that? Yes, they can. I don't believe they want to attack, though. I know I was big roaring beforehand, but even if they attack this, this guy will simply flank them. They're just throwing guys away if they do that. Fifth Corps continues to refuse its flank. 
And they move into the woods where they're somewhat protected from the cavalry. This time Longstreet is last to move. Now he can attack just the way he wants to attack, and there's nothing the Union can do about it. They'll turn and face. Hood will move around. He'll be able to rally next turn. And they go to push the Union out of Groveton. Again, you'll notice here that I know pretty much how far two-thirds is, so I don't have to do a lot of time, spend a lot of time measuring. If I were playing with an opponent and he was concerned about my movement, I would measure in front of him. All right, let's see what we can get here. The Army of Virginia attack. Singles last unit. Now outflanked. Three hits from the Confederates and he's lost, but he does two hits on the Confederates. Spent units are eliminated with two hits. The casualties mount. And the last attack. This is just a detachment. I should have only rolled one die. Does not do anything. And it's destroyed by the attackers. Nothing to gain here. Union falls back. That ends turn seven, but looky what we have here. Union has lost six. The Confederate have lost three. On day one, six breaks the Union. On day two, they get the rest of their forces show up and the additional infantry block raises their total needed to seven. But that's tomorrow. Today at six, turn seven, the Northern Army has broke. And while the HQ rule works, it's not as fun as Vegas trains. So fear not, Vegas trains are here to stay. Let me know yourself in the comments below. Good game.